Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us for episode 60 of our virtual Masonic education series. That's a pretty incredible feat, if you ask me. Um, on behalf of the Rubicon Masonic Society, we're always excited to be with you as we gather together outside of our lodges to learn a little bit more about Freemasonry and how to better utilize the tools of the craft within our everyday lives. Again, this episode does mark our 60th episode of our virtual education discussion since we started in 2020. For those of you who are returning visitors and have been with us since the beginning, we greatly appreciate your support and feedback. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. We hope you enjoy the education and discussion tonight and hopefully good enough to want to come back and learn some more. First, as usual, I would like to offer special thanks to the men and brothers at the William O'Ware Lodge of Research, Lexington Lodge Number 1, and of course, the Rubicon Masonic Society. The executive officers of Rubicon are Worship Brother John Bizak, Worship Brother Dan Kemble, Worship Brother Alan Martin. We appreciate your all's help and support, as well as all of the other Rubicon brothers who help out behind the scenes. My name is Brian Evans, and we will now proceed with the business of the evening. Worshipful Brother Alan Martin, are you with us this evening, able to deliver an opening devotion? I am. Grand Architect of the universe, the giver of all good gifts and graces, thou hast promised that when two or more are gathered together in thy name, thou will be in the midst of them and bless them. In thy name we assemble, most humbly asking that you bless us in all of our undertakings. We ask that you bless our present assembling and to illuminate our minds as we labor to become better men. Amen. So mote it be. Thank so mote it be. We'll go through some protocol and then we jump right into the education. As you know, our virtual Masonic education aims to help us to become better men, always devoted to our family, our faith, our neighbor, our country. So brothers, may we all come together to learn, to subdue our passions, to discipline our minds this evening and to improve ourselves through the tools of Freemasonry. As you know, any opinions expressed during this education will be those of the presenter or the participant and they do not necessarily reflect the, the views of the Grand Lodge, any Grand Lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. Uh, you, by participating with us, you consent to our full disclaimer, which can be found rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash disclaimer. Again, brothers and friends, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are welcome to attend and participate, so please always be mindful that anything discussed should be suitable for Masons of all deg degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners should be expected at all times. No alcohol, smoking, no eating, no foul language, no discussion of politics or religion. We appreciate your understanding of those protocols. Uh, we, of course, recommend the attire for each meeting is a coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your video to identify yourself to others. If you're not a Mason, please type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera if you so choose so all attendees can see you. Please reduce background noise and avoid outside distractions. Brothers and friends, tonight we are blessed to have Worship Brother Dan M. Campbell presenting tonight on a topic that many of you possibly have heard. And this is an excellent pre presentation. And Worship Brother Bizak, will you please do the, the honors of introducing our special guest? I will. Thank you. Dan Campbell is a member of past master and a fellow of William O'Ware Lodge of Research in Walton, Kentucky. That's the state's oldest research lodge. He's a member of Hayes Lodge 517 in Kentucky, Nova Cicera Harmony Lodge number two in Ohio, and Alba Lodge number 222 in D.C. He currently serves as recorder for the Rubicon Masonic Society. Brother Kimball is the co-editor of the transactions of Rubicon Masonic Society and co-author of notable men in Kentucky history who happened to be Freemasons, and 21st Century Conversations about Freemasonry, Candle in the Dark. He also has authored or co-authored several essays and papers concerning the factual history of Freemasonry and its historical purpose, philosophies, uh, and lessons of the craft. And he was co-producer of our popular documentary, The Masonic Table. He's a, an admitted bibliophile, and he writes book reviews for the Rubicon Masonic Society and the uh, William O'Ware Lodge of Research, and he serves on the board of directors for the Scottish Rite Valley of Covington's William O. 
Ware Library and join us tonight for the presentation about how over the course of three centuries, what Freemasons have passed on from generation to generation has become distorted. Brother Dan, the floor is yours, sir. Well, good evening, brothers. And uh, Worshipful Brother John, thank you for the introduction. Worshipful Brother Brian, it's good to be with you this evening. Uh, happy St. John the Baptist Day. Uh, uh, today, June 24th, is St. John the Baptist Day. It's the 307th anniversary of the founding of the Grand Lodge of England. So happy birthday to organized Freemasonry. Uh, it's How appropriate is it that we're gathered here this evening on St. John the Baptist Day to explore Freemasonry together? St. John the Baptist uh, is a symbol of zeal. And your presence here this evening along with us indicates your zeal for Freemasonry, and I very much appreciate that. Uh, to those of you who are expecting uh, Brother Chris Ruley this evening, uh, Brother Ruley was unable to join us due to some unanticipated circumstances. I believe he will be with us in November. So uh, please uh, uh, keep him in your thoughts and in your prayers as well. So you see on the screen some children who are playing a game. And this is a game that I recall playing when I was in elementary school. And many of us played this game. It was called Pass It On. Now, some of us knew it as the telephone game. Some of us knew it as Chinese whispers. In my neck of the woods, we called it gossip. Regardless of the name, the game was almost always played in the same manner. Children would arrange themselves in rows or lines, and the first would whisper something to the next person, and in the next person in the line and then say, pass it on. And by the time whatever it was that was being passed on reached the last person in line, it was generally something quite different than the original statement uttered by the first person in line. So the amusement of the game was to see just to what extent the original message became distorted as it reached its final destination. And Freemasonry, as we experience, has been organized for 307 years as of today. Over the course of that time, a significant number of facts relating to Freemasonry have become distorted in many different ways. So I'd like to spend a little time looking at just a couple of examples, and I'll use Kentucky Freemasonry, the brand of Freemasonry with which I'm most familiar, as a reference point. And many men here this evening are past masters. Most Kentucky Lodges use the installation ceremony from Henry Pirtle's Kentucky Monitor, which was published about 1920. And the, the Pirtle monitors the, contains the monitorial guide for the annual installation of officers. And during the ceremonies, certain questions are propounded to the master elect, and an affirmative answer is required in each instance. One of the questions is this. Do you admit that it is not in the power of any man or any body of men to make innovations in the body of masonry? And the required answer is, I do. And thus from year to year and from generation to generation, we pass on the notion that innovations in masonry are forbidden. But contrast that statement with the language found in Anderson's Constitutions of 1738. Anderson wrote, it's not in the power of any person or body of men to make any alteration or innovation in the body of masonry without the consent first obtained of the annual Grand Lodge. Now notice the last clause in the preceding sentence. Clearly the compilers of the constitutions of 1723 and 1738 believed that innovations in the body of masonry were permissible, provided that they occurred with the consent of the annual Grand Lodge. The Constitutions of 1723 and 1738 are the foundation of all existing Masonic law. And as we trace our Masonic lineage back to the founders, we arrive at the Grand Lodge of England as founded in 1717, and Anderson's Constitutions of 1723 and 1738. So how do we make the leap from the Constitutions of 1738 in which innovations in the body of masonry were within the contemplation of the leading masons of the day, provided that they were made with the consent of the Grand Lodge, to the ceremonies contained in Pirtle's Monitor, 
which is a restatement, by the way, of the Thomas Smith Webb monitor. And then we pass on those same ceremonies and viewpoints today. Now, Kentucky isn't alone passing along this distorted view. Within the past three months, I've attended table lodge ceremonies in Indiana and Ohio. And in each one of those, the master's given a charge to the craft assembled. And that charge includes the phrase, guard against innovations. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not criticizing in Repertal or the use or the ritual that's used in Kentucky or the ritual used in any other jurisdiction. Henry Pearl's contributions to Kentucky Freemasonry and Freemasonry in general are substantial, and he's worthy of the high esteem in which he's regarded. Pearl was a genuinely admirable Freemason, and it's unfortunate that contemporary Kentucky Masons, as well as Freemasons from other jurisdictions, aren't better acquainted with the entire body of his work. If you're fortunate enough to do so, find a copy of Kentucky's, I'm, I'm sorry, find a copy of Pertle's book, The Lost Word of Freemasonry, published in 1950, just five years before his death. It's a masterful analysis of our search for that which was lost. And I've said for years that Pertle accomplished in about 200 words what Albert Pike tried to do in a thousand pages. Hurdle accomplished that in 200 pages, not 200 words. But getting back to the point to, of the Kentucky Monitor, Hurdle was merely passing on what had been passed on to him, and the ritual of other jurisdictions merely passes on what they have passed on for generations previously. The Hurdle Monitor contains the same language as does its predecessor, the H.B. Grant Trussell Board, and before that, Rob Morris's edition of the Web Monitor. So let's return again to the Constitutions of 1723 and 1738. The propriety of innovations in the body of Masonry was already a topic of discussion at that early time. It can be argued that the establishment of the Grand Lodge in 1717 was an innovation, as none of the Gothic constitutions that existed at the time provided for the creation of a Grand Lodge. Further, by 1730, lodges in England were working what can only be called the greatest innovation in the history of masonry, the Master Mason degree. Prior to the middle 1720s, organized Freemasonry consisted of only two degrees, the Entered Apprentice and the Fellowcraft. The introduction of the Master Mason degree around 1725 proved to be enormously popular and was the subject of Samuel Pritchard's sensational expose, Masonry Dissected, published in 1730. In the late 1850s, Albert Mackey published his list of landmarks, which according to Mackey are the characteristics of Freemasonry that have existed since time immemorial and can never be changed. Mackey identifies the system of Masonry as consisting of three degrees, Mackey says the three degrees are, of masonry are a landmark. In the early 20th century, Masonic jurisprudence scholar Roscoe Pound identified the Hiramic legend as a landmark. How can the system of three degrees or even the Hiramic legend be considered a landmark and having always existed if we know they didn't exist at the time of the founding of the Premier Grand Lodge? In fact, the history of Freemasonry is littered with examples of innovations in the body of Masonry, and the founders of the Premier Grand Lodge, along with the compilers of the Constitutions of 1723 and 1738, recognized the reality that such innovations would occur and wrote into the Constitutions the safeguard that innovations required the consent of the Grand Lodge. So how, then, did the distorted view that no innovations may be made in the body of masonry come about. The language, it is not in the power of any man or body of men to make innovations in the body of masonry, first appears in William Preston's Illustrations of Masonry, published in 1772. William Preston's the father of the ritual used throughout Freemasonry today. And Preston simply omitted the words without the consent of the annual Grand Lodge. And we don't know if he did it intentionally or if it was an accident, but the omission of those words is the source of the distortion that we have about innovations. As Preston's work spread, 
and it was later adapted by Thomas Smith Webb, who used it in the United States, the distorted view that no innovations are permissible in the body of masonry has been handed down from generation to generation and has become the perception of the majority. The notion that no innovations may be made in the body of masonry has taken on the permanence of, that's the way we've always done it. Ironically, the idea that no innovations are permissible in the body of masonry is in itself an innovation. Now, before proceeding, I want to make clear that this presentation really isn't about innovations. It's about how over the course of the centuries, what we've passed on from generation to generation has become distorted. Consider, if you will, the inconsistencies found in proficiency examinations across our several jurisdictions. In Kentucky, our Book of Constitutions offers certain guidelines with respect to proficiencies, but ultimately, the determination of an, of an acceptable proficiency is left to the discretion of the lodge, and what one lodge considers a suitable proficiency may be radically different from what another lodge may define as suitable, and that may occur even in lodges within the same district. The requirements for an acceptable proficiency vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as well. In jurisdictions that have one-day classes, the idea of being proficient before being passed to the next degree is discarded entirely. The inconsistencies found in our approach to proficiency examinations illustrate from lodge to lodge and jurisdiction to jurisdiction and also from generation to generation that we're simply inconsistent in what it is that we pass on to our membership. In his famous 1875 essay, Reading Masons and Masons Who Do Not Read, Albert Gallatin Mackey closed with these words, the ultimate success of masonry depends on the intelligence of her disciples. Now, what measures are within our power to address Brother Mackey's point of producing informed and intelligent masons? It's within the ability of every lodge that's represented here this evening to devise and implement a structured Masonic education program, which begins with a petitioner even before he's been elected to receive the degrees of Freemasonry and continues with the newly raised Master Mason and goes beyond the mere memory work required to obtain a proficiency certificate. Why is it necessary to begin with the petitioner before his election to membership in Freemasonry? This is the opportunity for both sides to establish their expectations for the upcoming process. As lodges, at the very least, we need to make clear to the petitioner what it is that will be expected from him in terms of a time commitment, a financial commitment, an attendance commitment, and what we expect in terms of attire. We also need to listen to our petitioners to understand what their expectations are about what it is that they desire to receive from us. In some instances, one or both parties may be unable to fulfill the expectations that are expressed. And it's better to know that before the degree process starts than it is to learn it after it's underway. The establishment of clear expectations on both sides is one of organized Freemasonry's greatest weaknesses. Men come into Freemasonry having no real idea as to what it is that will be expected of them and having no meaningful idea of what to expect from their Masonic experience. We need to do a better job of, ex of establishing and explaining our expectations. Following the election of the candidate, but prior to initiation, an orientation session should be scheduled that prepares the candidate mentally, spiritually, for the initiatory experience. A discussion of the history of the lodge would be appropriate along with a chance to meet its principal officers. It's an opportunity to establish trust between the candidate and the lodge and to again reinforce the solemnity of the obligations that our candidate is about to assume. Following each of the degrees, in addition to the required memory work, which is in no way to be minimized, there's an opportunity for in-depth explanation 
of the philosophy behind each of the degrees, the practical application of the working tools in each man's life, a review of the different symbols contained in the several degrees, and an overview of the manner in which our degrees build upon one another. It may be recognized that ritual and the memorization of ritual are essential to the Masonic experience, but quoting ritual does not serve to explain ritual, and one of the purposes of the structured Masonic education program is to go beyond ritual to examine the ideas and philosophies that shaped it. The structured Masonic education program should also include a review of our Grand Lodge constitutions, our Lodge's bylaws, and the standard order of business that's used in our state of communication. Now, what can we hope to accomplish by establishing a structured Masonic education program? First, we can provide uniformity to our members in that the information presented is consistent from generation to generation. Second, we can ground men in the history and philosophy of Freemasonry. No Mason should ever be handed a proficiency card unless he's able to identify the symbols of the craft and explain their meaning and the manner in which they're relevant to daily living. By providing this level of education, we can prepare men to actually participate and practice Freemasonry, engaging in it as an active process rather than viewing it as a passive event. Third, we can put an end to the degree mill process where men are given the mistaken impression that after merely having been rocketed through the degrees in 60 days, that they're truly master masons. We know better than that. Those men are merely members. The process of becoming a true mason and especially a master mason is a lifetime experience and a lifetime of work. The idea that a master mason can be created in 60 days is merely nonsense. We can create members, but for a man to truly be a master of the craft takes a lifetime of diligent effort. And again, and again, the degree mills only perpetuate the distortions that exposure to the degrees is all that it takes to become a master mason. And finally, we can address some of the distortions that have occurred in Freemasonry over the last three centuries. Freemasons in the 21st century have unprecedented access to books, to online articles, to journals, proceedings. Unlike our brothers of merely 100 years ago, we really have no excuse for passing on anything other than factual information about our credit. By offering a factually accurate portrayal of Freemasonry to our membership, we allow Freemasonry to define itself rather than being defined by the uninformed. And the ideas that I've shared with you this evening aren't new, they're not innovations, and they aren't original. In the late 1960s, the Grand Lodge of Kentucky published a 55-page booklet titled The Lodge System of Masonic Education for Lodges of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. 35 years later, our Grand Lodge again produced a 31-page pamphlet titled the Kentucky Masonic Lamp of Knowledge Mentoring Program. And both of these publications offered specific steps for introducing structured Masonic education in the Lodge. Now, although they were largely ignored, both of these efforts served to remind us that the need for Masonic education beyond ritual has long been recognized. Does a structured Masonic education program work? The limited data available indicates that it does. It's been suggested by Masons in Kansas, Kentucky, Ohio, and Oklahoma that lodges implementing a structured Masonic education program have retention rates above 60%. For at least the last 60 years in American Freemasonry, and from the time that membership rates began to decline, we focused our efforts almost exclusively on getting more men into Masonry. The Structured Masonic Education Program flips that focal point, and the emphasis becomes getting more masonry in the men. How can you implement a Structured Masonic Education Program in your lodge? Go back to your lodges and begin to have discussions within the lodge. 
Prepare a list of the things that a man should know before he becomes a member of your lodge. Prepare another list of the things that he should learn as he progresses through the degrees. Visit other lodges that have implemented a structured Masonic education program and ask them what parts of their program work best and ask them to identify the parts with which they've struggled. At the end of the process, let it be the decision of a majority of your lodge as to when and how to implement a structured Masonic education program. To have a commitment to such a program that will prove long lasting will require the commitment of the whole lodge. It's the lodge as a whole that must decide what it is that will be taught and what it is that will not be taught. It can't be the decision of one man or a small group of men. And these efforts may be noble, but they're doomed to failure. Quality at Masonic education embraces many different viewpoints and perspectives. And exposure to the spectrum of opinion encourages men to think and ultimately grow as Masons. And by the way, that's the sort of environment that made Freemasonry so popular in the 18th century. The decision to implement a structured Masonic education program, once adopted by the Lodge, then becomes a part of your Lodge's culture. And within a few years, it'll be the way we've always done it. Brother Mackey was correct when he wrote that the future of Freemasonry depends on the intelligence of its disciples. We have within our abilities the opportunity to produce members who are educated and intelligent in the art and science of Freemasonry. In doing so, we can greatly reduce the likelihood of that what we pass on to succeeding generations will be distorted. We can also hope to clarify some of the distortions of the past. A commitment to the creation of a structured Masonic education program is an idea that your lodge can adopt right now. Brothers, pass it on. Brother Brian, that concludes my presentation, and I will happily participate in any discussion that anyone may have. Great. Of course, Brother Dan, thank you. I couldn't think of a, of a better topic for discussion for our 60th episode, and um strongly encourage and welcome all brothers to have comments and let's talk about this this is an important topic something that is seemingly very simple but uh but equally is a complicated to to actually do these things so um i'll maybe start but would love for for people to ask some questions raise your virtual hand you can write them in the chat box or you can chime in if it feels right so this isn't a question worse brother dan to put you on the spot um, but I'm but I'm curious, right? So what I, what I'm thinking is, I agree hundred percent with everything you're saying. So then my other thought is, well, why are there brothers or masons out there that would disagree with what you're saying? what What is their perspective? Why did they feel as though maybe what you're saying is not is not good? what What is their justification point that would rebut what you just said, you know, in a professional way? What, what would you think they're coming from? Well, when you limit me to answering in a professional way, that, that, that <laughs> takes away my immediate response. Uh, um, you know, I, I think, first of all, Brian, I, I think we need to recognize that we start from different basing, from a, from a completely different base, from, from, from a different point of view. Uh, so many men uh, come into Freemasonry <laughs> with a certain set of expectations. Uh, and, and I think this goes back to the point that I made about how we don't do a good job establishing those expectations. But if you came into Freemasonry expecting that it was going to be primarily a social event and the focus was going to be on the social aspect of Freemasonry, if you came into Freemasonry expecting it to be a civic club and the focus was going to be on doing good works, then what would you see as the need for a Masonic education program? And I think if, if, if you come into Freemasonry with those preconceived ideas that it's all about uh, the social aspect, it's all about good works, then I think education is a tough sell. Uh, if you come into Freemasonry seeking to learn, as we say we do when we come into Freemasonry, then we begin from the standpoint of what can we do to make the learning process logical? What can we do to make the learning process effective? Do you think that 
Um, do you think that it's the men before us that are at fault for this on where we are today? Or is it the men coming in or both? It's, it's both. I mean, clearly, I mean, what, what we've passed on has, has gotten us to the point that we are right now where there's not much emphasis on education. And it's, it is a slow process of distortion over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Worshipful Brother Bizak uses the phrase bending granite, and that's kind of where we are right now. We have this Masonic culture that's hardened like granite, but it didn't harden like granite last night. It's been passed to us generation by generation by generation. So uh, the generations that have gone before us have, have given us distorted information, and we tend to we just passed that distorted information on right now. My criticism of the current generation of Freemasons, maybe it's not current, maybe it's those of my age uh, and my generation, we have tended to pass that on without examining whether or not it was accurate. And, and that, I think, is, is um, something for which we ought to be held accountable. Yeah. Thank you. Brother Jerry, Worship Brother Jerry, good to see you. Go ahead. Good to see you, too. Um... Brother Kimball, I give this lecture five stars. I tell you, um, you you really gave us such a great summation of um, the major uh, problem that's facing Freemasonry today. Um, as you know from my earlier contributions to these discussions, uh, my lodge at South Pasadena is kind of on the cutting edge in in Los Angeles. I mean, or in California, um, thought to be one of the more liberal kind of places. Um, but we find this in, in, in our um, Grand Lodge as well about it being, you know, a social club kind of a kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the, the thing that I want to contribute to this discussion comes out of the discussions I've been having with pillar officers right now who are who are uh, poised to present a proposal to the lodge um, to become more observant and and um, so of course that's already on the grapevine and this kind of thing and um, you know, I spend any time I have at the lodge talking about Freemasonry and the things that I'm hearing the most, and you touched on it, and I'd just like to add a great big exclamation point behind it. And that is the resistance based on this is the way we've always done it. And one of the things that I've garnered from that, that these discussions and and I'm I'm using it frequently and finding that it really has the power to make somebody stop and think for a minute. Think about our our um, unofficial motto: making good men better. The very premise of that is no longer doing anything because that's the way you've always done it. The whole idea of masonry is to follow a higher path to try to quit doing it the way that you've always done it, which is kind of mindlessly going along with, um, with the flow. Freemasonry, and I know how much this is uh, uh, respected because of uh, uh, Brother John's and yours, Daniel, and yours, Brian. Um, this is what I hear coming from you and reading your, your materials and things like that. Um, this, this, this fraternity was, was intended to be special, to not just be friendly and and charitable in the terms of donation but we really and truly make ourselves better better people and um i think that what one of the things we really need to do put behind us is um uh 
that we we can't we can't change because uh that's the way we've always done it and i also thank you for something that i did not really uh hadn't hadn't caught in my own readings the way that the um the qualification on no no innovations um being without the consent of the grand lodge and anybody that reads anything of the history of freemasonry has to realize there's 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 uh, evolution going on all the time the idea of observant masonry and and the education you're talking about and those kind of things is to really pay attention and direct that vector in a positive direction and and deciding to be a rotary club with with a ceremony to start maybe they have one too but um ours is meant to be as as was said um this is a lifetime thing this is a way to change the way you live your life that's the kind of masons that we need but it's not the kind we're making because we're I, but i think that there's a real hunger for it I see that in the guys that are coming into to my lodge now, but that that that's the big hurdle to leap is this idea that uh, that's the way we've always done it. And what I see in a lot of that, another another thing that goes hand in hand with it is everybody deserves their turn. One of the things that that is going to be proposed is having multi year terms. You know consecutive terms um and and if what you're going after is excellence that makes all kind of sense but everybody should have a turn i don't think that that's right i think that to have your turn you need to actually be skilled in in um in ritual and you have to have evidence uh, of uh leadership qualities but that's that's just random the way that I see masonry going on all around me, and I'll shut up at this point. But what what a, what a great summation that you made, Brother Dan. Worse for Brother Jerry, I, I think you'll find this uh, particularly uh, fulfilling. Uh, the example that I used about innovations uh, came from an article that uh, John Cooper wrote, and I believe oh, wow. it, I believe it was published uh, several years ago and Fraternal Review. So. Uh, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, the, the source of that. Um, the, the notion of that's the way we've always done it is a powerful notion. It, it is it is the granite that, that Worship Brother Bizet speaks of, and it's hard to change. But just for a, a different perspective, um, I, I had a friend uh, several years ago. He's deceased now. He was a, a psychologist. And, uh, and we were having a conversation one day. And uh, and he said, you know, you, you've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect, haven't you? And I said, well, yeah, of course I have. He said, you know, that's really not true. He said, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. He said, if, if you practice your golf swing, but you're using an incorrect technique, your golf swing is never going to be perfect, but it's going to become permanent in the way that you do it incorrectly. And the same is, is can be applied to anything that you do routinely. If your technique's incorrect, it becomes permanent, but it will never become perfect. In the last 60 years, I think you can make a pretty strong argument that in Freemasonry, our technique has been incorrect. It hasn't worked. So it may be the way that we've always done it, but we need to acknowledge that the way we've always done it just doesn't work. And it's time to look at our technique and see if what we have made permanent is something that is in fact injurious to us and from what you were were talking about before um uh, about inno innovations um one of the premises of observant masonry is to return to practices that have fallen out of use mm -hmm. things like the the chain of union and um uh those those, those are and the and the um the uh chamber of reflection of reflection those those were those were old practices 
And in our issues that we've done in the fraternal review on those, we haven't done chain of union yet, but but um, the, there's the observation that um, discontinuing the use of the chamber of reflection, for example, that was the innovation, and now it's become it's passed into the into the the cement uh, the the granite. Yeah, cement's easy compared to granite, but. Um, at the, it's become one of those way we've always done it. But you're right, it's it's the way we've done it as long as I can remember is the way it actually functions for each of the uh, each of the, the men who I see fascinated by by that concept. And and I think part of it, one of the things that's often used to justify it is that thing of the misinterpretation of the original idea of no innovations in masonry. But even even the the Haramic uh, uh, ritual was uh, a recent innovation. By the time they had the first Grand Lodge, before that they had um, Noachite Freemasonry for some period of time, which is very poorly documented. Uh, Where's brother Dan? If if you could approach this question as though let, let's say that i am a prospective mason interested in learning more and, and joining a lodge somewhere within the united states and i ran across a rubicon video and i started watching it i'm hearing it and i'm thinking okay oh, this is this is very interesting i'm fascinated by masonry but you just said dan what we're doing now doesn't work so if i'm if i'm on that side and i'm hearing that could you help me on better understand from that mindset perspective why you said that what that means well, it, it, it doesn't work it, it, in, in the sense that um, our, our 60 day from uh, entered apprentice to master mason process it doesn't produce masons. It produces members. It doesn't produce masons. That's what I see as not working. Uh, for the for the non-mason who is in, interested in becoming a mason, uh, I think the very first conversation between the, um, uh, the lodge and the prospective member is what is it that you're looking for what do you want if, if you become a member of, of x lodge what do you think you're going to receive as a result of that and, and let us tell you about what our perception of what it is that we have to offer and let's see if your expectations and and our uh process are, are, are remotely in tune with each other and, and i think you know that, that goes back to what i i did mention in, in the presentation and that is you know, we we don't establish expectations on any side. There's no real communication. We get a petition and we're thrilled about that. And we're so thrilled about it. You know, we, we don't really want to have conversation with our petitioner because we're afraid he might change his mind. So, um, you know, we just rush the guy through the degrees. But I think if we really want to deliver the Masonic experience to a man, it, we have a responsibility to sit down with that that individual get to know them and, 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 you know, worship brother Brian, I know that your lodge does this. There's a process through which a man goes before he's allowed to even petition the lodge. And it is a time of getting acquainted with each other where the petitioner learns the characteristics of the lodge. The lodge learns the characteristics of the man who's petitioning. And I think that's where we're missing. I think that may be the most important thing that we're missing, is, and that is we're, we're trying to match up men with masonry who have no idea uh, about the character of either. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, Worship Brother Bizak, did you have a question or comment for Dan this evening? I do. Excellent presentation, Dan. I'm sorry. Aside from um, education and proper instruction of candidates as they pass through the degrees, what else can a lodge do to advance specifically the historical intent, aim, and purpose of masonry? Well, I've, I've talked about grounding men in masonry. And, and I think, you know, again, masonry defines itself and masonry speaks for itself. Uh, to, to get from an entered apprentice to a, a master mason, 
and we're introduced to six different working tools. And, uh, you know, what a great way to begin the study of Freemasonry than by having the discussion of what, you know, what's the practical meaning of that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a philosophical meaning, and when we're told what that symbolic meaning is during the degrees, but how do you apply that to your life? You know, how, how do you take a 24-inch gauge, and how does that affect your behavior in any meaningful way? You know, what do you do with the square or the level or the plumb or the trowel? How do you apply the gavel, uh, the common gavel to your life? And I think when you begin to go beyond the ritual and talk about here's how this affects you on a behavioral level, I think you start to see changes in that, that particular point. And that's just one place to start. Uh, but I, I think, you know, they, again, going back to what's given us in the ritual, I certainly like the discussion about the working tools. And it's allowed to do that if they don't know anything about the working tools to start with. And that's all that's been passed down. Well, and, and that's a great question. And, and the only way that you can possibly do that is have a commitment. You'd have to have a commitment at the lodge level before you ever bring a man in that we're going to learn this. And we may be learning it together. But certainly in many lodges that currently exist where the only thing that they know is what's been passed on to them from generation to generation, and that is to get a man in and get him in through the, the degrees as quickly as possible so that he can be the junior warden next year. Uh, you, you're not going to, you're not going to have much of a climate or much of an environment that fosters that type of grounding. But if there is someone in that lodge who wants to change the culture, who wants to make a commitment to learning about Freemasonry, I would hope that that individual would say to the petitioner or the candidate, we're going to learn this together. You know, we're going to go through this at the same time. Uh, that's the best you can hope for, I think, in that scenario. Would you say it, no matter what, it all comes down to a question of leadership? Oh, certainly. There's no question about that. You know, it, 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 it is all about leadership. Uh, and, and our leadership in general has ignored uh, the necessity of structured education programs. And, in, you know, in too many instances, the... Um, approach of institutional Freemasonry is uh, to view education as mechanical. Uh, you know, we're going to teach you how to do the mechanical things, like how do you ballot? Uh, how do you introduce visitors? You know, the, those sorts of things. And, and, and those are all worthwhile subjects, and you know, we need to know those things, but education goes much, much beyond that. But yeah, it's absolutely about leadership. And, and I, I think I should probably take a moment to acknowledge that you know, we're, we are somewhat preaching to the choir tonight. You know, the, the men who are on this particular presentation probably already have some level of structured and sonic education in their lodges. But the challenge is how do you get it outside your lodge and start having discussions with people in lodges where it isn't uh, either accepted or implemented? And, uh, and let's talk about how we can change the culture of Freemasonry to in a way that allows us to actually make masons and not just members. Good point. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Brother Thomas Lamb, go ahead. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. I likewise enjoyed your presentation because it really connected a lot of uh, my views and my findings as I go through learning about Freemasonry. One interesting interesting point you raised about uh, it being a Noachite before it was the Hiram legend is the, an, an interest I have is in the origin of the third degree. And um, the first there third degree is in any writing is a, a lodge of Dumbarton in Scotland. And it was, I, my, it doesn't say it, but it's my opinion that it was the Noachite uh, background that they used, and it wasn't until the Saglier visited Edinburgh number one and went back to London and formed the Anderson uh, constitutions and that, that the third degree with Hiram started down in London. Anyway, uh, what my point is that one thing we don't do as a lodge that I think would help us to be better is we don't tell the Mason, the new Mason, 
what is expected of him. We focus on what are they expecting and what do, what do they want to get out of it and can we understand what they want to get out of it. But in actual fact, do we actually tell the mason what we expect of him? And I think if we did, uh, we'd be in a better position. Finally, the word entered apprentices there for a good reason. It was an apprenticeship. I actually went to an apprenticeship of five years, but the original apprenticeship was seven years, and it was a learning process. And I think that we rushed the degrees too close together. I would have no problem with having a different degrees a year apart, and there a formal training <clears throat> program as an apprentice. So just some thoughts. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. I, I I think you know we we our shortcoming is we don't establish expectations, and we do this way too fast. If um, if you're a child of the '60s and '70s, you know, like I am, you know, I I think back to uh, Simon and Garfunkel. I threatened at some point in fine at some point in time to give a presentation that's titled "Feeling Groovy Masonically." You remember this Simon and Garfunkel song? I think it was called. I can't remember the number, the something bridge song. John, you may remember that. Um, but uh, but the first lyric is slow down. You move too fast. You got to make the moment last. And that's I, I think that's the, the mantra that, that we ought to mm -hmm. adopt as Masons. We need to slow this process down. We're not in a race. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, slow it down and let men experience it and savor the experience as they move through it. Apropos of what uh, Brother Lamb just raised about getting into what do they want, that's, and I think you referred to this yourself in your talk just now, that's what you do before you hand them a petition, that you do that. that at, our, at our lodge, you have to come to events for six months before we give you a petition, and you have to be meeting guys, and we have a regular um uh you know introductory kind of kind of descriptions but but that's the phase where where you get to know what they want and in my talk on guarding the west gate i actually recommend if it turns out that that's not what your lodge is offering or if your lodge is asking a lot more than that uh, uh, make sure they know that in advance, and if that's not their lodge, help them find an, another lodge. Um, but 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 then, when you we start educating our our candidates as they're going through the degrees, um, we are exploring not just the 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 symbols, but what what it, what is expected of you, what do your brothers expect of you uh what 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 uh, you uh owe to 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 the lodge to yourself to society all of that kind of stuff responsibility Brett. and and it's in those it's in those discussions where you start seeing who are your potential officers in the future and it's not everybody mm -hmm. uh, Brother Thomas Lamb, do you, I'm just a quick curious question. Do you meet, or I'm sorry, do you open on the entered apprentice degree in your jurisdiction or on the master mason degree? Master mason. So you're not allowed to open on the entered apprentice degree? Yes, if, if you have uh, entered apprentices uh, present, um, we will open on the entered apprentice uh, Degree. In other words, it depends on the need. If no, if no, if we're all master masons, we enter right into the master mason, and that's it. Washington. I'm in Washington, state of Washington. But if we have entered apprentices, in order to allow them to participate, we open on the entered apprentice, or likewise, we can open on a Freemason, uh, um, fellow craft, and conduct official lodge business on those degrees. Um, I guess we do because we don't. Well, it depends if we're taking uh, boats 
and things of that nature, the uh, entered apprentice or the fellow crafts are expected to leave. And we, we open on the third degree in order to do that business. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Brother David Crickard and Brother Jerry Johnson, I'm going to come back to you in just a minute after John Cameron's mentioned, but if you guys could just talk briefly a little bit about the orientation process that we do at the Lodge, just kind of offer that as another perspective on uh, educating men before they actually go through the degrees. Uh, that'd be great. Brother John Cameron, go ahead. Brother Evans, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Brother Campbell, um, you have managed to put things into perspective for me um, as a result of your discussion. Living on the East Coast, the Atlantic coast of Canada, I'm used to the fog. And I have been in a bit of a fog um, for a number of years now. And clarity is starting to take place, and you've contributed that, to that clarity. The church I belong to, like other organizations, is going through some significant problems, declining membership, lack of financial resources, and that caused me to think that what am I doing to ensure that my great-grandson can appreciate the legacy that was given to me by my great-grandfather? And Brother Kimball, you, you mentioned that, in fact, we've allowed these changes in whatever form or shape they take to slide through. And so essentially, I have been sliding through my responsibility to my church and to my fraternity by not questioning uh, what was taking place. You, you were right, they're sort of preaching to the converted, that's why we're here. But we are now, I, I feel, I am, I am responsible now to speak out vociferously and strongly and provide leadership to prevent this next generation of Masons coming through to, to not pass it on in the correct manner. The responsibility uh, lies with me. I'm 78 years old. In Lodge, I'm seen as a grumpy old fart uh, that, that, you know, just, he's going to be gone in six or seven more years. So just, but that's not good enough. That's not, that's, that is an excuse that doesn't work for me. So you have instilled in me a desire to take this message uh, because we all share it and, and be a disciple and pound uh, the message, not only into my lodge, but within uh, my district and within the jurisdiction. I, I, I may become a pain in the ass to a lot of people, but I, I believe that that is my responsibility to the legacy that I've inherited, and it's up to me to begin to correct it. So thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Brother Dan, for providing some clarity in this fog I've been in for a bit. Thank you. Brother John, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by your comments, and, uh, and, and you're most welcome for, for anything that you may have found useful in that. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've reached a point where I understand that that being in lodge um, with with my brothers, they're they're going to do things that I think aren't necessarily wrong or bad, but they just simply aren't Mason. Uh, and and, and um, you know we we've sort of uh, come to a, a um, I, I guess a, a point of detente. I point that out to them, and then they go ahead and do it anyway. But um, uh, you know, if, if, if nothing else, I think I have made the point to, particularly to younger men who are in the lodge, that if you want to engage in this type of activity, that's fine. But understand that that this isn't really the practice of masonry. And if you want to know what masonry is, you know, uh, let's get together and we'll talk about it. We'll explore it together, and then you can make your own conclusion about whether or not the activity in which we're engaged, you know, really falls within. Uh, the exploration of masonry or the practice of Freemasonry. Thank you, brothers. Uh, Brother Cricker, do you want to talk a little bit about our orientation process? And, and Brother Jerry, if you want to add into anything? Yes, sir. So uh, are you hearing me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan. That was an outstanding uh, 
presentation as usual. Uh, so to talk about the orientation process at Lexington Lodge One, we do it, uh, we require that, that, that a candidate be oriented, orientated prior to him even asking for a petition. So uh, the main point being is it's, uh, we want them to uh, understand what our uh, expectations are and also so we can understand what their expectations are. Uh, we have maybe an orientation, I would say no more than three times a year, probably two times a year. And that's due to the, uh, I'd say that we want to get an inner apprentice class of roughly four, no more than six men. And uh, it usually takes about that much time. So uh, some, some man might wait around six months, another man might wait a couple of weeks. So anyhow, so that's the, the point of the orientation is to, you know, sit them down and talk directly. I shouldn't say sit them down like they're getting scolded. That we, we bring them in, we talk to them about uh, what is expected at Lexington Lodge One. And we spend probably an hour to an hour and a half having a discussion with them, showing them around again, making sure if they have any questions about anything, we answer them. But yeah, and you know, you cover uh, history, expectations, uh, and also fees. You want to bring up money at that point. That might be an issue. So uh, I'll let Jerry take over from here. Uh, I'm sure I left a good bit out. Thank you, David. Brother Dan, great presentation. Excellent points all around. Um, yeah, we do require... Um, prospective candidates to uh, attend an orientation. We actually have one coming up later this week at lecture number one. I think we're going to have uh, three or four uh, prospective members attend that. Um, uh, bear in mind, by the time they come into an orientation, they've been to several dinners, um, maybe as, as many as several months worth of dinner. So they become pretty well acquainted with uh, some of the members of the lodge, uh, some of what we do. Um, but the orientation sort of serves to underline all that. Um, like David said, we, we, we uh, sit down with them. Um, uh, and we set expectations early on, but even at the orientation, we're dressed in coat and tie. Uh, we have an agenda to go through at the orientation, so we're not winging it. Um, you know, we talk about the lodge history, um, the structure degree program. And a lot of this they have probably already heard just by talking to different people uh, at the dinners and so on. Uh, but this sort of puts it all together and makes sure nothing got missed. Uh, well, and we tell them when they petition the lodge, they're basically uh, assuming they're accepted. They're signing up uh, for a two year uh, commitment. Um, you know, the entered apprentice classes typically run from nine to 12 months and fellow craft and master mason and complete the rest of the other 12 months, maybe even a little bit beyond that. Um, and we uh, tell them that they should take this commitment with all the seriousness uh, that they would if they were uh, going to uh, evening classes at a college for you know, some master's degree or something. Um, that's a level of commitment we, we require. And of course, it's, it's two ways, right? So they can ask us any questions they have, um, anything they may not have been comfortable asking before, um, we do show them around the lodge again if they haven't already got the tour, um, kind of explain. Uh, we're not as rushed uh, like we might be during dinner, so we have some time to explain um, uh, a little bit more of the, the furnishings of the lodge, its history, and so on. Um, but I think it's important to, if, if you do go with the orientation, um, to have a plan. Don't just, uh, you know, meet for 20 minutes and you know, they walk out not really knowing much more than when they walked in. So I think it's good to uh, have an agenda, watch history, what's expected of them, the uh, education program, that kind of thing. So, uh, David, did I miss anything? Uh, I'll just, you did not miss anything. I want to add something, you know, like uh, Worshipful Brother Evans says, he goes, this is hard work. You know, we, we tell him up front too. It's like, what you're going to do is hard. This isn't easy. So, you know, are you willing to put in some hard work? Thank you, brothers. You know, and the, the context there is again trying to set the tone. This is the time where either we either we proceed for in a long-term commitment relationship or we're okay and we part ways. It'd be better to set and draw the line up front and part ways 
in my opinion, then go through two years of tremendous energy and time put into trying to mentor and help someone and teach and you're learning as well. Uh, and then for them to leave or not come back. That's very disheartening. So have the uncomfortable conversation up front. And it's not uncomfortable. It's just honest. It's just uh, getting any unknown or, or or concerning questions and answers out of the way. Um, Brother Jerome, go ahead. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I agree entirely with uh, with what you're talking about. And, and my lodge has a similar thing. Another thing we added a year ago, and it's still working really quite well, um, we're Wednesday night lodge, so we usually try to have um, the last Wednesday of the month. We call it gentleman's night. We're not having a meeting, and we're not we're we're not in the usual location. We're up on our our uh, level above the. Uh, the lodge where the library and the, the recreation room are. We've got just serve yourself kind of stuff for, for food and drinks. And we invite anybody that's interested in masonry. And, and it's just for fellowship, getting to know people. So that is another opportunity. And uh, myself and uh, two or three of the other uh, members of the uh, education committee um, make it a point to join discussions where the visiting people, the curious, uh, the prospects, even before they become potential candidates, um, are there and and just ask them, what is it? What brings you to life? What are you interested? What would you get? And if you can do it, even not just one on one, but where there are another couple of other guys in the lodge, I think that there are some guys in the lodge that are just kind of floating along. This before the last few years when he had the education programs, and they find out stuff that, that about the lodge that they've been a member of, <laughs> in these these kind of kind of discussions. And the other thing that I would uh, add add, and that I think. Uh, uh, Brother Brian, um, that it that it eases the blow a little bit, and it doesn't come up with the judgment that you're not Mason material. Um, what I said before about suggesting another lodge that might be more uh, uh, inclined toward what the um, visitor tells you that he's looking for, or if he also, uh, and typically this, these are the same guy, um, isn't interested in taking a couple of years and spending all this time taking a, virtually a college class, um, <clears throat> but uh, point, pointing them to another lodge. You know, there there are lodges. There they all have their own their own culture, and and you know um, the lodge two towns over. And in a big city like we are, there's a lot of them. Um, go check out that lodge. I, I've even invited guys to say, I'll say, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna go to a stated meeting on a Thursday night lodge here soon. Would you like to go with me? I introduce you there. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the worst mistake is just what you said, Brian. We, we by, by the time we've invested a a year or two and all of this. And there are those guys and we've had them since we've introduced this too, that still disappear. Mm -hmm. Worst Zach, was there anything else that you can think of that might be worth mentioning regarding the orientation petition process? Well, I think Jerry and David certainly covered it, but there is one thing that underwrites the whole reason we have the orientation process. Uh, and that is to ensure that we do have that one opportunity to get more familiar before they get a petition. And in doing that, our standard has been, we want men who have time and wish to learn and participate in masonry. Mm -hmm. If they are coming to masonry so they can go to the shrine, they need to find some other lodge. If they have three jobs, uh, can't come to lodge, can't participate in the classes, we need to usher them to another lodge at all. Get them through quick and get them what they want. But if they come to 
number one, we want them there for the right reasons, and we want particip participation. And I think they need to know that before they try to grab a petition and submit it. Yeah, good point. Good point. Thank you. All right, maybe one or two more. David, go ahead. Thank you, Worshipful Brother. Uh, so, Worshipful Brother Dan, and I guess the the, the first questions are rhetorical questions. Like, were were early lodges having these types of conversations? And you, you know, because we seem to talk about this quite a bit. And I'm going to ask the hard question now: Why should we care? You know, observant lodges, lodges that you would consider observant or who are trying to move in a direction where they're establishing an education program, they're going to survive. Why are we wasting calories on uh, trying to fix other lodges when we could be putting calories into, you know, things that early lodges were talking about, like astronomy or some type of physics, new or AI or anything, something, you know, that's, not saying that talking about education and industry, but there's a lot of other subjects out there to talk about. So my question is, why should I care? I think I, I'll start with saying I, I would hope that my presentation isn't construed as uh, suggesting that we go out and try to fix different lodges. Um, you know, <clears throat> A structured education program has the ability to work in a lodge where a majority of its members want it. Uh, so if you're talking about lodges where where the majority is not interested in it, it's it's probably not going to gain any traction there. And, and just as a general rule, I, I think it's safe to say every lodge anywhere uh, regardless of what their characteristics are, reflect what the majority of its members want. Uh, the majority of, of, of the members define the overall personality of the lodge. So I, I, I'm not I, I'm not crusading here and saying let's go out and fix all the lodges that don't have structured education. Um, what I am saying is that. If we adopt that in our lodges and we know that it works, uh, it becomes a model. And if if there if lodges are serious <laughs> about their longevity, they can look at the model of a lodge that's successfully doing this and say, you know, that can work for us as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's it's all about modeling the behavior that you want to see in others. Uh, we do that in our own specific lodges. Uh, we come to lodge and we practice Freemasonry in a way that models for new members what they should be doing. And as lodges, you know, as uh, observant lodges or as best practices lodges, you know, we can model for other lodges in our area um, uh, some methodology that works. Um, if, if this isn't about trying to change the this is not an effort to change the culture, but it is an effort by which the culture may be changed, if that makes any sense at all. Yes, sir. And so that comes back to a question I wrote earlier. It says, can or should the Grand Lodge or the research lodges produce a structural or like a skeleton template that you don't have to do it all. You could maybe just do one part of the first page, you know, it's like it, it, you know, I think Lexington Lodge One does a great job at it, but I think if I gave another lodge or, you know, say, hey, this is how we do it at Lexington Lodge One, they might not take it as well as if it's coming from the Grand Lodge or a lodge of research. I'm just in, in a structure that's it's very loose and you can turn the ship a little bit at a time, you know, not try to turn it on a dime. Well, I, I think overall, I mean, it, it would be helpful uh, to, to, to masonry in general, it, it would certainly improve masonry in general if grand lodges uh, across uh, the world would take the position that we ought to put more emphasis on education mm -hmm. and that you know, we'll provide a template for what we think uh, a quality education program would be 
and again, an education program that goes beyond mechanics and really talks about the philosophies and the symbols of the degrees. Um, individual lodges, subordinate lodges, are, are going to participate in that at varying levels. And again, it's going to depend on the culture of that lodge. But if you had a Grand Lodge that was modeling that kind of behavior, saying, yeah, this is important, and you know, we think this is something that, that you ought to be engaging, uh, in in your lodge, then I, I think it, it, it couldn't do anything except improve the culture. There, there's one element in all of this that we really haven't touched on tonight, and, and that is the very nature of masonry. Uh, we, we value this process that we call mouth-to-ear teaching, uh, and, and we're very proud about that, and we've done it for centuries probably truly since time immemorial and there's nothing wrong with mouth to ear teaching but it it lends itself to creating distortions and one of the things that a more structured program does is it creates an environment where there's less likelihood of distortion and if a grand lodge were to adopt that particular type of approach then over a period of time and in a wider scope, you would have, I think, less opportunity for the distortion of information. Thank you, Brother Dan. That's awesome. The headwind there is that the Grand Lodge's primary interest is more Masons, more Masons, more, Masons, more dues, et cetera, more donations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and 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 i understand that and, and you know the, the the grand lodge is functionally a business and 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 and, and i get that completely and, and it is their job to attend to the to the business aspects of the jurisdiction i simply wish they would broaden their interest a little bit so that it included not just the business aspects but some encouragement of um the uh um, real purpose of, of why we're here. I was recently told by a brother who said that this was said to him directly by a Grand Master, um, and that was that the only purpose of the Blue Lodges is to create members. And that says it all right there. I will, and I will not mention names, but um, I blanched when I heard. That. Yeah, because I I think lodge masonry is where mason is the heart of masonry, and that the the purpose of the grand lodges is to facilitate that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think we've got a pyramid that's that's upside down. Yeah. Speaking of upside down pyramids, I want to share a brief, really brief situation that has opened my eyes about a few things. Um, so for the past few months, practically we've been doing some form of an addition to our, to our home. And we've had a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of time into it, but today everything changed. And everything really made me think about a lot of different things. Uh, but specifically for tonight, masonry. Um, if, if the foundation you're starting on is not good, or if the measurements you're taking off of something square are not square, even by a few inches, that can drastically affect everything that you're trying to do in 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 perpetuity. So we're 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 doing a, a we're doing a, an addition of sorts to our home. We're about ten inches off square in one thing, which sounds like a lot, but when you're thinking about you know three thousand square feet type thing and big open areas, uh, you don't really think about it. But we were going to put down pavers in this area, but now because of that's not square. There is no way we can put down pavers in this area without trying to figure out how to hide it. 
So now the, now our entire project that we've been working on for, for so much time, we have to figure out how to hide this mistake. So that way it, it doesn't look bad going forward and completely change the direction of some of the things that we were planning to do. So the point of all that is uh, make me feel a little bit better. So I don't, you know, get sick because of how much money it goes into something like this is, is that if you, if you connect that with masonry, and if you put all this time and energy into something that's not square to begin with, well, then everything is going to be affected going forward because uh, it's not square with that individual. And it's just amazing. It's amazing how I knew this. And, you know, you're okay in geometry. That's probably my best subject. But to actually go out and see a string line that's not square, it brings it all into perspective, especially for me, for masonry for this topic. So by gosh, brothers, we need to find men on the square. And if before you start doing anything, make sure your work's on square. <laughs> Uh, Brother Dan, great presentation, as always. Um, any other final thoughts that you want to leave us tonight before we move on? Happy St. John's Day, brothers. What a, what a great place to be on St. John's Day. Yeah, great. All right, brother, we're going to move on and close out this presentation. A few little uh, uh, things we need to address. First of all, our next Masonic education. Gerald, you got this? I've got my pen right here. <laughs> All right, July 22nd, uh, Monday, July 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Just found out who our speaker is. Worship of the Bizak, would you please share that? With sure. Us? It'll be uh, S. Brent Morris. I'm sure everyone is familiar with him. He is going to be speaking about the Taxel hoax that took place uh, beginning in 1892 and going all the way through 1898 and the basis of, for much of the anti masonry that we still endure today yeah and he's he spoke a lot about that not spoke he written a lot about that in his book is it true what they say about freemasonry so this will be a great topic right thank you all right brother and if you're not already aware one of the first messages in our chat box today was an invitation to the rubicon masonic society 12th annual festive board and second consecutive year we're having a conference in lexington kentucky it is September 27th and 28th, and uh, might as well just pull over the URL here. If you go to Rubicon Masonic Society slash conference 2024, there'll be a brief two or three minute video that explains what this is, all of the details that you need to know, um, and and so forth. We're, the conference will, conference will highlight the following Masonic authors, William Preston, who will be delivered a presentation by Andrew Hammer. Uh, Thomas Smith Webb will be presented by Timothy L. Colhane, Jeremy Cross, presented by Worship Brother S. Brent Morris, and Rob Morris, past Grand Master of Kentucky, will be a presentation delivered by Worship Brother John W. Bizak. And the overall theme to this conference and festa board is the shapers of our ritual. So if you're able to join us last year, I can assure you that this one we hope to top. Um, strongly encourage you to attend and participate all of the details can be found on this page. Price per seat is $100 if you're just going to attend the Festa Board or the conference, or if you want to attend both, the price per seat is $175. Um, so all of those options can be selected down here. So we hope to see you there in Lexington, September 27th and 28th. Uh, all of your information can be found at Rubicon Masonic Society slash conference 2024. Go check it out. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> You're now, a good salesman. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, not a good, not a good measure, though. <clears throat> uh, if you uh, were not able to attend our conference last year, then this video here will give you a really good snapshot of the education that was delivered during last year's conference. So please go check that out as well. Uh, and that is found on our YouTube channel. And uh, let us know what you think about that. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, you have a website that has a lot of information on it, thecraftsman.org. Do you want to just mention a, a few little things uh, that's kind of gone into the foundation of this site? Uh, well, it's been a site that's been there for some time, and it was upgraded uh, over the last year. Uh, there's dozens, literally dozens, of essays and commentaries by uh, many uh, Masons who are well known in the United States. Uh, there's references, there's links, 
Uh, it's connected to uh, several research lodges. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Everything on it is free. Yeah. Most everything on it is free. And what's the address? Uh, craftsman.org. Thecraftsman.org. It's right on the screen up top. Ah, okay. Um, and Worship Brother Bizak, would you mind just talking a little bit more about Philolathes, please? Sure. Uh, Philolathes Society, brothers, was founded in 1928. It's uh, an international Masonic Research Society and the oldest independent Masonic Research Society in North America. It was started to serve the needs of those seeking uh, deeper insight into the history, the rituals, symbols, the Freemasonry, as well as just spread, spreading Masonic light. Uh, to learn more about that, if you'll follow the link that's on that slide, and I'll post that link in the chat box after this announcement. And if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. And the Philolathes will be participating as a sponsor and providing additional education at our conference as well, correct? That's correct. Okay, terrific. Uh, brethren, if you have not already done so, the Transactions Volume 1 of the Rubicon Masonic Society can be purchased at uh, Amazon. So go check that out. Let us know what you think. Sometimes we might have some revisions that have taken place. So if for some reason it is not there when you go to find it, just go look back again and it'll be up there uh, if it's not already. And of course, this was mentioned at the outset, uh, the Masonic Table documentary. Uh, go take a look. Let us know what you think. The festival that we will be having here in September, uh, what you will see on this DVD or this video rather is is very similar to how we practice our festive boards and how you will participate with us this fall. Are there any final comments from anyone before we proceed to close? Gerald, of course, yes, brother. Of course, I, how could I? How could I not? Um, <laughs> I thought it's worth mentioning that the. Um, Masonic Restoration Foundation um, has uh, finally uh, scheduled its uh, its meeting, uh, and it's going to be in Philadelphia, wonderful place, um, at uh, um, on uh, August the weekend of August 22, 23, 24, or maybe it's 23, 24, 25 that weekend in August, and it'll be. Uh, uh, a, a really wonderful um, uh, educational opportunity for anybody that's uh, really interested in in um, in uh, observant masonry and and of course uh, a lot of the the guys are here. Uh, I, the brother Bizak, you're still vice president of that, aren't you? I'm on the board. Yes. Okay, you're on the board. Yeah, but it's 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 really good, and I'm I'm planning on going myself. I hope to see some of you there. Great, thank you, Gerald. Where's Brother Allen? Would you please do the honors of delivering a closing devotion, sir? Yes, sir. Brothers, let's pray. Grand Architect of the Universe, as we prepare to part company, and we keep in mind that we are still together in spirit and in purpose. We work for your great purposes through masonry, so bless us and grant us the necessary strength, wisdom, and courage to continue our efforts with enthusiasm and creativity. May your love be the guide in our thoughts and actions now and throughout our lives. Amen. So mote it be. Uh, brethren, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Our next meeting again is July 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, no need to RSVP. You're on our list. We'll be sending out emails the morning of the, each meeting. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, until next time.